还是觉得在国外虽然并不是没有在国内是好的，还是能够练习一下，把你的手学当成一个，用手学当成一个，然后上下左右摆拳，然后看着自己的技术，然后就有个姿态，就很小的姿势，然后在那儿就相当于比较自然。然后，对，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，然后，Um, if you have any grading questions, please talk to the TAs and uh, try to resolve it. Uh, you know, and uh, if uh, you can't resolve it with the TAs, come to me and, and we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, last time we talked about the Turing test, uh, whether machines can think, uh, the foundations of AI. Um, what is intelligence? It's still hard to say. Uh, we know it when we see it, but uh, it's very hard to define. Uh, so the Turing test defines intelligence as whether something, some entity, uh, can pass a Turing test. A bunch of Q and A after a short period of time, say half an hour or an hour, you determine whether there's something intelligent behind the curtain, and you can't look; you can just interact like texts. And uh, with this famous paper, Turing founded the entire field of AI, and uh, it's still going strong today. Today, machine learning is at the forefront of most you know, highly capable systems, including self-driving cars and recommendation systems, and you know, almost anything that involves AI of one kind or another. And machine learning is a, is a sub-area of artificial intelligence. Uh, so this, this, this famous uh, Turing test decoupled the notion of intelligence uh, from being human, two separate things. Uh, we talked about uh, bots, like shadow bots, that can fool most people most of the time. Okay? They're so sophisticated into thinking they're intelligent or even human. On the other side, there's international competitions for the AI kind of uh, uh, Turing test uh, capable uh, systems. And they're getting more and more sophisticated by, by, by the day. Many of them are self, self learning. And so the question then boils down given the Turing test, which entities can pass the Turing test, rather than which entities are actually intelligent. And so it becomes relative to us humans. And certain things uh, can pass the Turing test uh, very clearly, and some can't. Uh, inanimate objects obviously can't, or lower life forms like insects will have lots of trouble with the Turing test. But other entities, and I use uh, examples from science fiction, because we don't have fully intelligent entities yet that we created. Pass the Turing test. Uh, other entities can clearly pass it, and uh, thereby we concede that they're intelligent uh, based on their behaviors and input output kind of uh, capabilities when we interact with them in a Turing test like scenario. So um, we uh, went through uh, some uh, criticisms of the Turing test. It's not all. But in games, there's some issues. Uh, there's something called the uh, Chinese room analogy or scenario, where you can have an entity inside a box that communicates intelligently in the outside world, and yet obviously doesn't understand what's going on. Like this guy that speaks in Chinese and passes the test in Chinese, yet doesn't even understand Chinese, much less what was discussed between him and the outside world. He just follows mechanical uh, instructions like code. Uh, and you know these kind of arguments and contemplations about intelligence and Turing tests and sentience and consciousness cross many disciplinary boundaries, including philosophy or psychology, uh, even biology. Um, so there's lots and lots of debate to this day as to you know, what is really going on. Um, reverse Turing tests you can have things like captchas that are very practical. So every day you take reverse Turing tests when you try to go into certain websites very practical applications of Turing tests. And then we went to some science fiction movie scenarios to kind of illustrate entities that were not just highly intelligent, but uh, perhaps even more intelligent than humans, according to the movie scenario. And uh, you know, for the movie buffs in the audience, uh, you know, we uh, left out any kind of movie names or descriptions, maybe for extra credit, try to nail down the rest of the ones that we didn't explicitly mention. Uh, 
Uh, plus, there's lots of good movies here that uh, you can dig into if you enjoy this kind of motif about AIs, bots, intelligences, modern day Frankenstein stories. For example, The Westworld is an amazing TV show. I highly recommend that. Thing. The whole show is basically the balls around the Turing test, its consequences, sentience, and artificial intelligence. Uh, so, uh, we said that uh, reality is quickly catching up with science fiction. So, uh, movies aside, you know, Isaac Asimov invented the, the word robotics, the field of robotics back in the, in the 40s, had great science fiction stories based on laws of robotics. So it was almost like codified programming uh, made into story plots, into novels, and the uh, fascinating consequences of all that. How many have read Isaac Asimov's robot stories over time or seen them? The movie I, Robot, with Will Smith actually, you know, is actually a pale shadow of, of Asimov's actual stories, because you know, it's only have two hours for the movie you know, to describe what's going on, and it can't be too deep or sophisticated, but... Uh, if you like the movie iRobot, you should really dig into Asimov's robot stories, which he wrote before computer science was invented, beginning in the 1940s, which is actually in itself amazing. So we described various real-life bots. So these are now not science fiction. These are, these are facts. These are technologies, products even, that you can buy. Uh, robots that can roam around and do things and do it very autonomously. Often they can do it by themselves, whatever the mission is, go somewhere and find some, some, something or some target or even some human and you know, do something dramatic, like right, destroy them. Uh, so literally, killer apps, uh, and we have them now. Uh, in practice, you still want a human in the loop, not so much for technical reasons, but for legal and uh, ethical reasons and uh, reasons, of, reasons of international law, you often uh, want to keep a human in the loop to do the final decision of go, no, go, you know, to pull a trigger or not. Uh, but it's becoming less and less necessary. You know, these bots, these drones, they do most of it and sometimes all the entire mission by, by themselves, which is both very impressive and also very worrisome because it raises Terminator kind of scenarios very quickly. You know, we've got aerial bots, reapers that can bomb things. Uh, You've got dirigibles, you've got helicopters, you've even got ones that are really tiny. You know, these insect-like bots and they will fly around and, and track things and do surveillance. And if some of them are squashed or destroyed, or stuff, not, no big deal, because it's they have a, a whole cloud, an army of these little tiny insectoid kind of bots. Uh, you can have them on the water, and uh, you can have them in self-driving cars like the Arpa Urban Challenge a few years back, from which uh, Modern cars like the uh, Tesla Model S has, has arisen in just a few years. And these cars can drive themselves. You know, and uh, how do I know? Because, because I got one. And so we mentioned that uh, we'll give uh, uh, demos soon enough, uh, maybe in a week or two, we'll set a range or weekend where I bring that in and, and take some joy on So you can see what an AI you know, bot car can do. Uh, it's actually three times as safe as a human right now in terms of accidents per passenger mile. Really amazing. Uh, insurance companies are, are adjusting to this, and soon you'll have cheaper premiums if your car can do self-driving. As it should. You should only pay less if it's less risky. Uh, this, car, this car will avoid accidents actively. Actually. If something crosses your path like a deer or another car or something, uh, it, would, it, would, it would get out of the way or stop. You know, within the, the bounds of the laws of physics, it would try really hard to prevent an accident. Uh, if you fall asleep on the wheel, or a drunk, or can't control your car, the car will take over, pull over to the side, come to a safe stop on the side of the freeway, and call 911, give you your GPS coordinates, and you should be okay. So, you know, should get hurt by yourself and not other cars or other passengers, uh, in other vehicles, or pedestrians. So this is not science fiction, this is right now, this is a product. You can, you can, you can buy one today. Uh, and self-aware uh, bots, uh, in space, they have a long history, because that's what you'd expect. Space exploration, very harsh environment, very far away places. Mars is half a light hour away from us. Uh, Pluto is about one light day away, away from us, outside of the, just outside the uh, out of borders of the solar system. Uh, 
inside, I guess, the outer pools of the solar system. And even on the moon, uh, you want bots. Uh, it's very hard to put humans in, in those kind of environments. It takes a huge amount of effort and risk and expense, for that matter, to, to get people out there. Uh, so, so we've had bots in space for a long, long time. Uh, this is Carl Sagan showing the uh, Mariner uh, spacecraft that uh, landed on Mars. How do you know who Carl Sagan is? Okay, good. He's sort of the uh, intellectual uh, daddy of the Neil deGrasse Tyson, that, uh, now kind of the modern Carl Sagan. The popularization of space exploration and science. Uh, Carl Sagan did it in the 1970s with a great TV show called Cosmos, a uh, 10 part TV series that uh, talked about all aspects of science and technology. Uh, an amazing show in itself. I, I, I highly recommend it. You, you watch it if you get a chance. There's a new version of Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think the old one is, is, is much more impressive uh, given that it was made in the 1970s before. The, CGI was invented, the few generated graphics were even invented. So now you're just more out of shows and movies. So we have bots that do AI on bars and uh, um, throughout the solar system, and we're putting more and more into space. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, car factories, not just car factories, but factories in general now use bots, use AI and robotics to, to build things. Uh, so factories now are mostly automated. But our factories are 98% automated. Just a few people on, on the floor just to make sure the robots are, are not revolting or something and doing their job. But uh, so now you have machines building other machines, uh, not just you know, other more mundane products like you know, shirts and shoes. Uh, so, so a lot of these bots that you see here are not even brand new. They, these have been around for five or 10, in some cases 15 years, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. Welding and assembling and lots of cool things. You can have bots now inside your house. The Roomba has been around for almost 20 years now. Uh, robotic vacuum. How many have a Roomba or a Roomba like equivalent robotic vacuum? Yeah, I have a couple of those. It's really, really cool. It can plug itself in when it runs out of battery and then recharge itself and then keep on going and keep cleaning your house. And you can keep on a schedule and your house just remains vacuumed nicely. And there's industrial versions of this, really big ones for hotels. Conference centers where a little one would cut it, but a big one will do you know, a much more thorough job. It's industrial strength. Uh, and then you have bots that make uh, animals and humans. Uh, there's actually products. You can buy a little robotic dog that will do very clever things. It will be a lot smarter than a regular dog, actually. The dogs are, are, are pretty clever. Um, it will go and fetch stuff and do tricks. And, uh, pretty cool. Uh, the price is dropping on some some of these products very, very rapidly. Uh, originally, the Sony Ibo dog bot, it was like $40,000, it was very sophisticated. Nowadays, you probably get bots at you know, Toys R Us for a few hundred dollars that would do the equivalent of what that did some years ago. And they're getting more and more sophisticated. But again, this is not science fiction. These are products. These are facts. These are actually devices that work, and not just prototypes, but commercial products. Uh, the, uh, Asimo uh, bot, again, a commercial product by Sony, can do very amazing things. Here we see it conducting an orchestra. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma and Cello was sort of pressed. He was trying to you know, shake his hand or even kiss it. I'm not sure which. But um, you know, conducting an orchestra is, is actually much harder than it sounds and, and looks. Uh, you have to do a lot of uh, eye-hand coordination, listen to the music, and see what the orchestra is doing, and uh, make very fine motor uh, you know, activities and uh, motions and uh, things like that. And bots that make you breakfast and then serve it to you. Um, again, these are products, commercial products. There are bots that you can wear. There's uh, exoskeleton kind of robots where you and the robot become kind of unified and you wear these robotic exoskeletons. And they'll increase your strength and, and you know, it could be 3x or 5x you become like Iron Man. It's Iron Man is basically an exoskeleton kind of bot that uh, Tony Stark works in his uh, Avenger movies, the Iron Man movies. Uh, that becomes, that's becoming a reality too. It's, it's actually, these are products now, some of them, past the prototype stage. Uh, it can help you go upstairs if you're having issues with, with you know, locomotion and mobility. So you can be a, you know, a paraplegic now 
and still use a bot that you wear if you move around and go upstairs and stand and, and, and do you know, everyday normal things, even though you don't have the use of your natural legs, which is amazing. It's an amazing capability. And it enhances your strength. The military, obviously, is very interested in that. Those militarized exoskeletons allow you to carry hundreds of pounds of you know, um, uh, material on your back and still run very fast and uh, go through hundreds of miles of you know, traversal of desert really easily and that kind of thing. So obviously there's military applications to, to, to these kind of robotics uh, capabilities. In fact, it's a military application to everything. And that's driving a lot of advances. And uh, unfortunately, that it takes... It takes a war to mobilize people to invent and create, uh, but that's kind of how it goes. Uh, so, uh, they're getting more and more prolific. There are robots now that can perform surgery. Uh, this is the uh, Da Vinci robotic surgeon. Uh, it does uh, surgery on people with uh, uh, micron level kind of precision, some millimeter kind of precision. It can do sutures. And to go inside your body with the entry. Channel to the body is, is a few millimeters wide. You don't have to open up the chest of the patient anymore. So, surgeons with big, clunky hands will go in there and do things. The robot can go into a tiny little hole, like laparoscopic surgery, and uh, it's a lot less intrusive, a lot safer, uh, a lot quicker, and you heal faster because you, know, you just have a tiny little incision wound. You don't have a big, kind of open chest kind of you know, surgery kind of scenario. And these bots are saving lives. They've been doing that for 10 or more years now. This is a product. Uh, how many have seen or heard about robotic surgeons? Okay. They do tiny little sutures inside their, their, their body and fix things with uh, robotic precision that no human can possibly match. And they're very tiny scale, some millimeter kind of uh, accuracy, micron type accuracy. Uh, and this is going to be going on for a while now. Of course, you still want some doctors in the room to oversee things and make sure nothing goes terribly awry. Um, that's always a good precaution, but uh, these robots uh, can do uh, major surgeries mostly on their own, under doctor supervision, just to be on the safe side. So that's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, you know, there's some, you know, some debate or questions whether you trust a robot to do surgery on you, but the track record is so good that at some point you wouldn't trust a human to do it instead of a robot because the robots have a much higher success rate than humans do when they perform surgery on patients. It's getting to that point, actually. And in some cases, it exceeds that, that benchmark. These robots are better than human, human surgeons. In some cases, in many cases. Not, not necessarily all the time. Uh, that's why we want humans in the loop. So there are conferences every year and contests about you know, robots, robotics, unmanned systems. It's just one example of what we see from the data that's been going on for quite a long time, more than a decade, in some cases, a decade and a half. Um, and these robots win prizes for doing clever AI-ish kind of things, looking for targets, making real-time navigation uh, decisions, and finding things, and retrieving things, and doing surveillance, and making um, you know, some, doing some mission that they're being assigned. Now, in some cases, reality, which we just talked about, has far exceeded the science fiction expectations. One of them is the Star Trek communicator. You know, the old Star Trek show, Captain Kirk's a BB off Scotty, and there's this flip phone kind of uh, communicated and looked like that. Back in the 60s, that was incredibly cool and impressive and almost unbelievable. You could walk around with a phone that's not tethered to anything. And you can call large distances you know, with perfect clarity. And uh, uh, out of curiosity, how many have seen the old series, not the new series, but the old Star Trek vintage? Amazing show. Uh, calibrated to the time that it was produced back in 1966, a long time ago. Um, so you know, Captain Kirk could do that, and then phones in the real world started imitating not just this capability of untethered long-distance calling, including mobile, but the form factor of these phones, like the Motorola Razor of uh, 2004, actually looked like a Star Trek communicator. You would flip it open, and you know, this would find that absolute two major kind of beeps that Captain Kirk would uh, sound off when he talked to Scotty to view him up. Well, fast forward another decade or so, and we have the iPhones. You know, this is the iPhone. Six, uh, of course, the iPhone the one was back in you know, 2005, I guess, roughly. Uh, and just to compare that phone with the old uh, school phones, and even with supercomputers like the Cray One of the 1970s, the iPhone uh, can do a couple of gigahertz worth of computation. Now you have you know, four or six cores, 
can run for hours or even days on the battery, of course, under, under a gram, versus a computer, a uh, supercomputer, even like the Craig One in 1976. It only ran at 80 megahertz. That was the fastest machine on Earth. And it only had 4 megabytes of RAM, not 4 gigabytes, 4 megabytes, and cost over uh, about $10 million. Weighed 5 tons and required 200 kilowatts of energy. So in terms of uh, performance for price, kind of ratio, uh, the iPhone is not just better than a supercomputer of the 1970s, but it's actually almost half a million times better. And this is just the iPhone 6. The iPhone 10 and 11 are, are probably 10 or 100 million times faster and more capable than the supercomputers of the 1970s. Of course, now we have much better supercomputers, but essentially we're all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets and purses, uh, which again is unbelievable. Remember, Captain Kirk's communicator, all he can do is call Scotty to tell him to be enough. That's it. Uh, he couldn't play chess on it, he couldn't shop on it, he couldn't uh, you know, do banking on it, and, and do searches on it, or, you know, databases, and everything we can do on our smartphones. That's uh, way above and beyond what was even you know, fancy food back in the 60s. It was a good example of reality not just catching up with science fiction, but far exceeding science fiction, our, our best expectations. You know, in the 60s, if you said if you, if you said a smartphone could do all these things to somebody in the 60s, they'd, they'd think, you know, not only you're crazy, but it's not even worth of a science fiction story because it's so unbelievable. The science fiction has to be at least somewhat believable to make a good story or it you know, can be completely outrageous. Right? But this is completely outrageous. Smartphones compared to what we thought would be possible or even hoped would be possible. So, you know, reality keeps surpassing science fiction in many scenarios. Another example is chess playing. You know, in the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, there's a sentient kind of evil computer called HAL 9000 that takes over the ship and you know, grapples with the humans and, and kills some of them and then takes over the, the mission. One of the things you see is it playing chess with uh, one of the astronauts and the computer beats him, actually. And back in the 60s, that was Unbelievable that a computer can beat a really good chess player. I mean, it could be an amateur, sure, but uh, not, not, a, not a real good player, and certainly not a, not a grandmaster. Well, fast forward about 30 years, and there's a reigning uh, chess world champion, Gary Kasparov, in 1997, looking pretty despondent there because he's losing to a computer for the first time in human history that, that world chess champion lost to a bot. And of course, it kept getting even more dramatic. Uh, and uh, nowadays, you know, be, uh, even even a team of grandmasters cannot even put a dent in even a, a, a small, unsophisticated chess application that can run on your iPhone. So your iPhone cannot beat a whole team of, of world champion grandmaster players working simultaneously. It's uh, it's quite impressive. Just to put it in perspective, uh, there's an ELO chess rating scale where a chess master is about 4,300 on that scale based on chess playing skill. And uh, only top 2% of tournament players actually have 2300 ELO rating or above on the ELO rating scale of chess skill. Grandmaster is 2500 and only 0.02% of the world competition players are at that level. And a super grandmaster is 2700, there's only about 30 in the world that can play chess at a grandmaster, uh, uh, super grandmaster level of 2700 on the ELO scale, there's only four that can play at 2,800, and the best players today uh, play at about 2,850. Uh, Bobby Fischer, back in Speak in the 1970s, the best player on the planet in the 70s, and some say the best player on the planet ever, um, 2,895, almost 2,900. Uh, who is today's champion uh, chess player? Yes, yeah, Magnus. Uh, and he, he can play at, at roughly Bobby Fischer level, some, some say a little bit higher, some say a little bit lower, about 2,900 on the, on the ELO scale. Uh, the best computers can play at 3,340 or higher. Uh, and this was true even 10 years ago. Now they're probably at 3,400 or higher than that. So no human will ever beat a computer again in chess. Uh, it's completely hopeless. So again, reality is surpassing science fiction by leaps and bounds and orders of magnitude in terms of capability. So now, now your iPhone can easily, quickly, and efficiently beat the, the world champion within minutes. Uh, it's quite amazing. Again, Kasparov couldn't take it very well. Um, you know, and it was very dramatic kind of 
you know, soul searching going on in 1997 when computers first beat you know, the world chess champion. People felt a little uh, depressed, despondent about that. And uh, but it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, you can't beat algorithms when they get more and more efficient. Uh, computer algorithms will win every time for a lot of different things, tasks. There's even a movie came out saying game over, Casper over the machine. The brain's last stand, usually a uh, cover story, uh, sort of over-dramatized for uh, uh, entertainment and dramatic effects in the media, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real trend. People feel threatened by technology. They always have. Uh, you know, when steam engines first came out back in the 1800s, people felt threatened that they're losing their jobs, their livelihood. Steam engines are taking over. They're kind of monstrous and inhuman in and soulless, and uh, there was a lot of uh, pushback against steam engines in the 1800s. Some people even destroyed steam engines. You know, Luddites, they, they would come and sabotage them and destroy them. Uh, you know, when cars first came out, you know, they, people said, you know, 1880s, 1890s, people said, no, horse and carriage is the way to go. Cars are kind of evil. The humans were not meant to go that fast. Um, it's unnatural. It's dangerous. It's an, Horse and buggy, you know, a horse will never jump off a cliff with you on top of a horse because it's trying to preserve its own existence, its own life. You know, it's sentient. Uh, cars have no sense of self or safety or concern for humans, and cars can do crazy things and collide and get smashed and fly off cliffs, drive off the road, and they're, thereby they're, they're very dangerous and shouldn't be used. Of course, today nobody's saying that anymore. Uh, and we all drive cars and we don't look at them as evil or as. Uh, soulless or, or extremely dangerous. I mean, there's still accidents and occasionally people get hurt. Um, but back then, it took a lot of social change and convincing to get people to get into cars and, and get them to go 60 or 100 miles an hour. That was uh, very, very uh, threatening to humans. Of course, now people are still afraid of other things. They're afraid of AI. They're afraid of self-driving cars. So self-driving cars are dangerous and they're uh, but actually, self-driving cars can, can save about a million lives a year worldwide, every single year. Well, that's more than you know, kind of the world war, you know, the level of casualties. So, uh, and, and there's a lot of resistance today to other things. A lot of people don't trust or don't want to see machine learning take over, but it's already, it's already beginning to do that. So we're well underway from taking over a lot of the sub-areas of human endeavor and uh, societal uh, tasks and goals. It's pretty interesting what's going on. Uh, a few years later, uh, this took a while, because Jeopardy is a harder game than chess, but the computer finally beat humans in, uh, in Jeopardy, which involves natural language and speech and interpreting sentences in English and giving answers in written form and uh, even voicing them out loud. So IBM Watson became the world Jeopardy champion just under a decade ago, and look at the scores. It wasn't even a close call. You know, this, these two guys, Brad and Ken, were world champions at the time, and they lost by a huge margin to IBM's Deep Blue. And IBM's Deep Blue became a benchmark and kind of a test bed for machine learning and AI, and now that platform is deployed to do a lot more than just play Jeopardy. Uh, and IBM Deep, Deep Blue and Watson became uh, technologies that IBM uses to solve lots and lots of other problems based on machine learning. Uh, and it's not stopping, it's just accelerating, it's got a trend. Just a few years ago, in 2016, Google's uh, um, uh, Go engine, Alpha Go engine, beat the world champion in the game of Go. Go is much harder than chess, the ancient Chinese game of strategy called Go. We have a 19 by 19 board. Um, and that took a while because the game tree for Go is a lot deeper and more complex than chess. There's a lot more possible moves. You know, chess might have 10 to the you know, 80 moves or so, 10 to the 70 moves. Go has been 10 to the 200 roughly moves a lot more uh, deep than, than chess in terms of game tree depth and breadth and different positions and strategies. Uh, but this happened too. Uh, so now the world champion role players are, are bots, not, not humans anymore. And as I was you know, going through my career, people said that this problem with playing Go will remain unsolved for at least half a century, maybe a century, maybe never be solved by machines. That's what we thought. It's so much more complicated game than chess. And chess took many decades to solve, you know, in terms of beating human, the best human players. So we thought, well, we'll take you know, either centuries or, or maybe unbounded time and, and never be mastered by machines against the world champion world players. 
Well, this just happened within a few years after that. So, and now computers are doing more and more, uh, even more sophisticated things. So, uh, and, and by the way, when the world champion was beaten by AlphaGo, by the Google, this is actually one of the games right there, in case you remember. How do people play Go? Uh, you do, you know, they were look more deeply into this. Uh, there was a million dollar prize, so the human had a high incentive to win this thing, not just for the million dollars, but for his reputation, but not only for his reputation, but the reputation of the entire human race against machines playing Go. You know, so there was a lot on the line, right? So, uh, and he tried really hard, but uh, at some point it wasn't even close. I think he only won one game out of a bunch, uh, not even close to a tie. And, and that was a few years ago, and now these machines are getting better and better. Uh, again, these are some. Uh, pictures from from the tournament, and uh, it was very dramatic, a lot like the Kasparov event of '97, which just happened three years ago. So reality is definitely catching up with science fiction very quickly. In some cases, exceeding science fiction expectations. Of course, we saw already self-driving cars, and you saw them in movies before, right? So uh, in Minority Report, there's uh, 20 years ago, there were kind of cool-looking self-driving cars. Will Smith and I, Robot, had a self-driving car. Uh, and today we got the uh, ARPA Challenge 2005, that quickly within a decade became the Tesla Model S, which you can actually buy and drive and drive itself on the road. Uh, pretty amazing. So it's catching up. In reality, it's catching up the science fiction, and it keeps going. And it's you know, just exceeding, making as far exceeding science fiction expectations. Uh, so around the house, you have already bots. We mentioned the, the Roomba that can vacuum for you. And there's even robots that can go into your roof gutters and clean the leaves out of your gutters. You know, you can have robots that go around in pools and keep the pool clean, you know, pool sweeper robots. Of course, in the 60s, you had in science fiction movies like Rosie the Robots and the Jetsons. Uh, now you have household robots that actually do stuff for you. Some of them can actually cook for you. Uh, the kitchen is big enough to house this robot over your stove today. The robots can make you meals now from scratch. Uh, and of course, uh, in the military arena, you know, you had movies that show military militarized robots like Terminators. The early Terminators looked like little roving tanks in the tracks and machine guns. Uh, and uh, in reality, now you have robots that not only act like Terminators, they actually look like the old T-105s from the Terminator movies. Uh, we still don't have, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of uh, you know, bots, but uh, that's probably not far behind. Uh, uh, in the movie Terminator Salvation, there was uh, actually a motorcycle form factor kind of Terminator that had a Gatling gun, minigun, rotary um, cannon on the side, and it was going around. And, and, and now you also have motorcycles that are actual bots that can um, drive around and navigate terrain and do things. That's actually one of the entries from the ARPA um, Grand Challenge in 2005. One of them was a motorcycle not a four-wheel vehicle. Motorcycle is harder because you have to keep your balance as well as navigate and do other things and be clever. So it's an extra uh, kind of level of challenge. So, you know, movie uh, bots often now become reality very quickly. Uh, so I'm juxtapositioning uh, reality versus fantasy versus science fiction. And as time goes, the two are less and less distinguishable. And they kind of blend together. And in fact, science fiction movies really serve, serve as the uh, motivation and inspiration for reality, for actual products and prototypes and technologies. So it's a, it's a good thing to kind of keep an eye on science fiction because it's, it's a kind of a litmus test or an indicator of where reality and technology are actually going. And it's really consistent uh, kind of a picture over time that the two are merging. Uh, in Terminator, also, you have these hunter-killer kind of flying drones that uh, you know, hunt and kill humans. And now we have that in reality. They can be helicopter types, or they can be uh, actual jet planes, or even supersonic or hypersonic planes. So uh, in the movie uh, Stealth 2005, we had a, a, a bot that would fly around that looked like a fighter jet, autonomous AI-ish kind of bot, and even land on carriers. Uh, now we got that. We got supersonic bots that can uh, go supersonically and dispense missiles and smart bombs and uh, autonomously track, find, and eliminate targets. And some of them can even land on carriers now. Uh, this is not even new. This is the unmanned combat plane, the X 
45 by uh, um, Grumman, uh, and it can do uh, carrier landings and also fly supersonically. Uh, and interesting thing about drones, um, the authorized drones, when you have uh, a, a plane with a human in it, the plane is actually very limited. Uh, for example, you can only make at most seven or eight, nine G turns, and that's it. In terms of aircraft maneuvering and dog fights, aerial dog fights against other planes. Because the humans will, will pass out at 7 or 8 Gs, and the human will die at 15 Gs. There's just too much stress on, 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 the, on the human the biological frame. Well, so the plane can't do any better than what the human can tolerate, even with G suits and, and other Herculean efforts to preserve the life of the human on board. So the bottleneck in performance, in terms of military platform, is actually the human. You know, Plus, it even takes a lot of space. Uh, it even needs uh, air support, uh, life support equipment like oxygen and, and you know, all sorts of ejection seats in case of trouble. And it's, it's, it's excess ex ex weight, excess ex payload capability that you pay or throw away. Um, a, a drone doesn't have any of those restrictions. So you can have drones uh, like the Reapers and these kind of drones that can pull 30 or 40 G turns. You know, they would kill any one of on board. Uh, they can fly much further, much faster, much higher. They don't need oxygen, they don't need life support, they don't need ejection seats, and all that to be extra fuel for longer range. And so drones today are far exceeding uh, human fighter planes. You know. um, the, the movie Top Gun, you know, part two is about to come out. Top two is you know, a sequel from the 80s movies, uh, making a new one. But, you know, the, the notion of humans going around flying planes and going to combat and saying, I feel the need, the need for speed, you know, what Tom Cruise does in Top Gun. No, that's kind of a you know, historical artifact now of the past that's no longer true. So most new planes on the military circuit are drones. It's getting more and more lopsided every, every year. Fighter pilots hate that because they don't sign up, you know, to become fighter pilots to uh, use a joystick in some warehouse to fly planes halfway around the world. They want to feel the G-forces and they're kind of macho and kind of cowboyish type characters like Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Pretty typical kind of fighter pilot, kind of tacky, ready to go, but uh, they can't keep up with the drones, so they're ineffective. And, uh, it's reality, again, it's not just catching up with science fiction, it's, it's exceeding the expectations, and humans are more and more left out of the loop in many scenarios, not just this one. Um, Sigourney Weaver and Terminator, uh, or rather uh, Aliens, in 1986. Uh, it's, uh, how many have seen that movie? So she, she dons a, she gets into an exoskeleton, a little power loader, and gives her a lot of strength and, and it comes and then she fights with the alien monster uh, queen and eventually defeats the alien, but it takes a lot of doing. So these kind of exoskeletons were science fiction back in the 80s. Uh, now you can, you can buy them. Uh, this is a military version of the exoskeleton. Uh, this is a prototype, but you can carry 150 pounds and walk four miles an hour and do that for hours and not get tired because it's the exoskeleton that's doing all the heavy lifting, literally the heavy lifting. And moreover, you know, in the comic books and the uh, sci-fi world, you had Iron Man, you know, Tony Stark, you know, this Iron Man suit, you know, all these interesting, impressive things. Uh, now you got that too. This is a product. It's, it's called the HAL 5 by a company called Cyberdyne. And Cyberdyne sounds like you know, one of those companies from Terminator, you're right, that's, that's why they named it Cyberdyne, Skynet, you know, uh, if you're a fan. Bottom line is, uh, for about 60K, you can buy an exoskeleton that will give you uh, 5x your actual strength, five times amplification of your strength with servo motors and all the joints. It'll run about five hours on a charge. Um, or if you can't afford 60K to buy it, They'll rent it to you for six hundred dollars a month. That's actually you know, quite quite affordable. Uh, and this is not science fiction. This is a product. You can get that. But not just right now. This was available already more than a decade ago. Uh, now they even have more sophisticated versions of these. Or, so if you work in warehouses and need to lift things, or need to do a moving job or furniture or whatever, you know, soon we'll see people in exoskeletons you know, doing those tasks, not just uh, humans only. Uh, and it'll be more and more prevalent. Uh, so, not quite Iron Man, but you know, getting there in leaps and bounds over time. So, there's reality catching up with, with the science fiction analogs. Uh, pretty impressive. And uh, robotic surgeons in the movie Logan's Run in the 1970s, there's Michael York, Sarah Fawcett, if you're a fan. 
that I want to talk to you about. Uh, and uh, these robots did surgery on humans. Uh, and now, of course, we have the Da Vinci system that we saw earlier that mentioned. Uh, that's a product, not science fiction. It costs about a million dollars and a half, uh, and already was available for a decade now. And many hospitals have this system to do surgery on, 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 on humans, much better than surgeons. Uh, Captain Kirk, if you if you're a fan, he once stole the uh, cloaking device from the Romulans to make the Enterprise disappear. How do you even know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. Science fiction, Star Trek, but stand. Uh, well, cloaking devices, again, were, were um, science fiction. Uh, Harry Potter had a cloaking device. That was more like an invisibility cloak that Harry Potter used in the early films. Uh, but now we have those too. We have, uh, this is actually prototypes, cloaking devices. You put something in the middle, and it bends the light around it and makes it pass around the object. So from the perspective of somebody standing behind, that object is invisible. If I can see the light coming from behind you as if you weren't there, that's the definition of invisibility. How many get that? Yeah, so we have technologies that do that too now. Cloaking devices. Just like Star Trek, just like Harry Potter. Now, they're kind of primitive and usually make some of them are two-dimensional. They don't have full 3D omnidirectional capability. Some of them work in specialized wavelengths, like uh, only in microwaves, you know, in wavelengths, and that kind of thing. Not in all spectrum wavelengths, uh, like you know, these other ones in science fiction. But they're catching up. And the fact that we can even do that in any wavelength uh, is, is already amazing. It's got kind of invisibility uh, capability. Um, this is an example of another invisibility cloak based on camouflage. Again, this is almost 20 years old now, uh, and it's advanced quite a bit since then. So, another example of reality catching up pretty quickly with science fiction getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, so, uh, you know, the trend is just very, very, very strong and undeniable. You know, it's, it's already happening. There's a famous cartoon of a, of a human being trying to clutch onto some last few things that humans can do that machines still can't do. And so they're, they're you know, look, he's writing things, only humans can pick stocks, or only humans can improvise jazz, or only humans can play ping pong. All these things are no longer true. So he keeps crossing them off. He's not confused. Bots can do these things much better than humans. And there's a few things left on the wall only a human can review a movie. Only people can have common sense, right? Uh, only a human can translate speech. That's no longer true also. This cartoon is about 10 or 15 years old. And already you see this cartoon is obsolete. Yeah? Because there are, there are things that humans can, uh, used to be able to do and machines couldn't, that now machines can do. And that fell out of the domain of human only kind of expertise. And this guy in the cartoon is getting more and more desperate. Uh, he's representing the human race, trying to clutch on, onto relevance and, and specialness and, and, and eliteness and capability that machines can hope to simulate. But uh, it's, it's a losing battle. Uh, so machines already exceeded humans in many endeavors and tasks. Uh, and so look on the wall here, it says humans, only humans can drive cars. This cartoon obviously is pre-2005, maybe early 2000. Uh, and now that's no longer true. So we keep crossing off more and more things uh, on the wall in this cartoon. So it's kind of an interesting cartoon that's getting more and more obsolete by the year, not even by the decade. Um, and so, you know, it raises interesting questions, uh, among which is, uh, you know, where is this going? Where, where is this technology kind of trends going? And the short answer is we don't, we don't know exactly. Um, and that's what a lot of people are worried about. It's not a clear trajectory. I mean, it's going to be kind of a paradise scenario where none of us have to work anymore. Computers will build our houses and fetch our foods after growing it and cooking it. And, you know, we can just kind of, uh, you know, have a nice life, uh, all of us, and all, all women. Uh, or will it be a more dark scenario, like Terminator kind of scenario, where you know, computers uh, will decide that we're just uh, not only unnecessary, but kind of a blight kind of planet and try to get rid of us. Because that's what we do to other species and other to our, and to other humans, too. Uh, so so uh, we can only hope that, that the robots won't be as nasty as we are. Uh, and, uh, you know, or, you know, reality could end some, somewhere in the middle. You know, somewhere in the middle where it's some, sometimes abused and sometimes used wonderfully. And, uh, and that's probably more likely than either extreme scenario. Uh, but we don't know. Uh, so uh, there's something called the technological singularity. You know, talking about long-term kind of uh, extreme trends, 
Uh, so technological singularity uh, was popularized by a futurist called Ray Kurzweil. Um, he's a technologist, an inventor, a futurist, a philosopher even. And uh, basically, it says that technology will get better and better and faster and faster, and computers will get more and more capable and far outstrip human capability that there be very dramatic consequences of that trend. And uh, machine intelligence and robotics can exceed humans by more and more uh, leaps and bounds and capabilities. And at some point, this you'll have there'll be a feedback loop because machines, among all the other things that they'll do, will build other machines that are even better than themselves, like humans do. We build machines that are better than the previous machines, and soon machines will take over that cycle. They'll be better and better machines, and they'll build machines that are faster, and they'll do it qu more quickly. And this evolutionary cycle of machines getting better and more efficient, and bots getting more uh, amazing, will uh, will accelerate beyond even human perception, much less human capability. In other words, at some point it will happen so quickly that a technological uh, uh, generations will not just take two years or one year. A technological generation can take one month or one week or two hours uh, if machines start taking over that, that feedback loop. At some point, humans will just be spectators. They'll just watch this happening so quickly, they won't even understand what's going on, much less be able to control it or affect it anymore. And that's kind of scary to a lot of people. Uh, and, and for good reason. You can run away from it very easily. The humans may, less be, may be left behind. Again, this is speculation. This is, this is kind of uh, Ray Kurzweil's um, vision of so-called law of accelerating returns as opposed to the law of diminishing returns. You have this fast forward feedback loop, and technology can literally run away from you, uh, getting better and better by the hour, not even by the year. Uh, and that kind of raises all sorts of ominous uh, concerns. And one of them is the gray goo, the so-called gray goo concern that uh, you know, machines or bots will start using stuff around them as, as raw material to build better and faster bots or machines. You know, so that the entire planet can become one big giant kind of hive of you know, technology, machinery, like, like, like the Borg, you know, Star Trek and Borg. How many, how many Borg from Star Trek? That's kind of a, this kind of scenario. Actually. They take over everything. You know, resistance is futile. Um, but Ray Kurzweil points out that Moore's law, where computers are getting faster by a factor of two every 18 months in terms of chips and capability and computation power, Moore's law is not just about chips. There are Moore's law, there are exponential growth laws in many other domains. And it gives you know, a lot of data to, to, to illustrate that, that assertion. It's not an assertion, it's a fact, actually. Uh, so processor performance grows exponentially. These are exponential scales, by the way. So on the bottom we have the year, and the, uh, the vertical scale is an exponential, it's a long scale, showing the improvement in microprocessor speed and number of transistors per chip. Average transistor price dropped from a few bucks per transistor in the 70s to a few picodollars you know, of transistors, of, of, of transistors per, 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 per dollar. In, in today, um, and microprocessor cost per transistor cycle is dropping exponentially, and there's many other exponentials that he points out. To. So the, the notion of Moore's law is something unique, especially in uh, one one kind of thing that doesn't occur anymore. It's kind of a misnomer. There's Moore's laws all over the place. Uh, RAM price, uh, the amount of me memory you can buy per dollar goes up exponentially over time. Uh, this storage is going up exponentially. And those, these graphs are not even new graphs. These are, some of them are showing exponential growths, you know, even, even way before today, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Uh, internet data traffic is growing exponentially. Uh, Supercomputer power is growing exponentially. Um, you know, you have now computers that can do petaflops uh, and even exaflops. Uh, Remember the powers of 10. Milestones getting faster and faster. So in terms of you know, biological progress, or just progress in general, it took billions of years for our planet to be created from you know, the Big Bang or whatever, you know, like gas clouds that, that gelled into planets and solar systems. Billions of years. And then life started about a billion years ago, and you had the first organisms, microcellular organisms, single cell organisms. And then 
you know, that took you know, a billion years for the first you know, for cellular organisms to, to, to evolve. But then multicellular organisms only took a few hundred million years. And to get from, you know, uh, amoebas and uh, tardigrades to, uh, to chimps and higher level organisms, mammals, only took a few million years. And, uh, and humans haven't been around for, for that long. You know, 100,000 years ago, we were all very hairy and walked around with our knuckles brushing and we were living in caves. We didn't have written language even. And 100,000 years later, you know, here we are with smartphones in our pockets, shooting ourselves into space. Uh, so, the point is, technological evolution and biological evolution you know, are increasing exponentially in terms of progress. Right? I mean, the entire web was just invented in the 1990s, just two decades ago. Uh, social media has just existed for, for, for 15 years, since early 2000. How many remember the days before uh, Facebook or any social media? I mean, you guys remember it. I definitely remember it. Uh, you know, there were no smartphones, there was no web, you know, you could go online and check your balance in the checking account or order a pizza through your smartphone in, in just a few seconds. There's, you couldn't do any of that stuff. And this is within the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, imagine what will happen in the next 20 years or 40 years or 50 years. Uh, it's, it's accelerating. So again, Ray Kurzweil makes this point that everything is accelerating exponentially on many fronts, not just Moore's Law. And uh, you know, we, uh, we just discovered electricity just about 150 years ago. Yeah. And now everything is electric and then getting more so. And, uh, that's, that's amazing rapid progress. So some people view humans or biological systems in general as just a, a bootstrapping mechanism for technology. Right? Humans could be thought of as a bootloader for AI. Some people take offense at that analogy. Uh, I don't. I think it's, it's pretty good. If we are a stepping stone in the way to a much more sophisticated life forms and, and intelligences and AI systems and self-aware robots and uh, AI, like that, I'll be honored to, to serve in that role. Uh, just like a monkey, you know, a chimpanzee shouldn't be insulted that we evolved from them. You know, if anything is a compliment, because he says, wow, look at that. Yeah, I did that. Uh, it may not be great for the monkeys once we start eradicating their forests and killing them off and putting them in zoos in large numbers, but that's a separate matter. Uh, they can still brag about it, even if they're not happy about the consequences. And the consequences don't have to be bad. You know, it's us humans that kind of <coughs> make everything in our image and uh, get aggressive and hostile and turn a lot of technology into nefarious uh, purposes like wars and conflicts and dominating other units and that kind of thing. But it doesn't have to be this way. It's not inherent in technology. Uh, it's just what you tend to do. But that's, that's a different you know, discussion and set of uh, arguments. A number of patents granted also grows in growing exponentially. Uh, the growth in gene banks, sequences, genomes, um, sequenced and our understanding of genomics. Uh, back in the 2000s, uh, actually, 1990s, throughout the 90s, there was a so called Human Genome Project where they tried to sequence a single human genome. And that took 10 years and $1 billion to, se to sequence one human genome. That took, that's how long it took and how expensive it was. And today, you can sequence a, 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 an entire genome, an arbitrary organism, in just hours for, for only about 100 bucks. And soon, you can be, do it for only a few dollars, and biometric locks can, can become. G genome sequencing machines, even in things as mundane as locks to open doors uh, or sign to your checking account. You have a DNA test that happens in seconds. And, uh, and we're very close to that. And, and just costs you know, uh, fractions of a penny per, per use. Uh, so Ray Kurzweil uh, says there's about six different epochs in the universe's evolution. The first one took a long time where physics and chemistry dominated and ruled. And that took a few billion years, and biology kind of took over. That took a few hundred million years for life forms to evolve as we know them. And uh, so these epochs take shorter and shorter. So the first was basically physics, and then biology, and then brains were you know, evolved to the point that they can start dominating the process itself in evolution. And now we're using our brains to direct technology and direct our own evolution. We have you know, genome sequencing technology like CRISPR, Cas9, 
can actually modify dramatically our own genome using our minds, our brains, and our technology that is brains invented. And finally, we created enough technology, and this just happened in the last few centuries, a very tiny fraction of the first three epochs. And each epoch is succeeding quicker. It happens much, much faster. There's all these fast forward feedback loops that are, that are, that are in, interacting with each other. So once technology is taken over, like it's, about, like it's doing right now, humans will become augmented with their own technology. Humans and their technology will merge. And how do we know that? Because it's already happening. You know, a lot of people are working, are enhanced, are enhanced in various cybernetic ways. There are people with pacemakers in their bodies. A pacemaker is not a trivial thing. It runs a full operating system, multi-threaded, has about 30 or 40,000 lines of code, and it does a lot more than just keep track of your heart. Uh, some people have chips in their brain that allow them to see. Right? Cameras in their glasses allow them to bypass their visual retina and, and visual cortex and inject the images right into the brain with electrical signal. So blind people can begin to see now. Um, they won't have 20-20 vision, but uh, they won't be blind either. And they can become more functional. How many you heard of these technologies? But a lot of people are walking around in augmented, in various augmented ways. Uh, you're already for years going to have you know the knee surgery that replaces your knees with titanium uh, parts or your spine or your, uh, your other bones. And uh, but many of these systems are active and can interact with the brain. You can have systems now that have a chip in your brain that if you want to walk, you could be a paraplegic. So you can't move your legs and you're disabled and you're paraplegic sitting in a wheelchair, but the chip in your brain can bypass the, uh, your, your damaged um, spine and uh, it can deliver the signals from the brain directly to your legs and to your muscles and you can walk while you have a severed spine or barely couldn't walk. So, so that already exists. It's not, it's not science fiction, it's, it's fact. It's getting more and more sophisticated and cheaper. And soon, humans will be augmenting all sorts of other interesting ways and intense types humans are, you know, uh, to a large degree, cybernetic in various ways. Imagine if you could surf the web in your head. Instead of, you know, Google Glass already got us halfway there. Google Glass, you know, you have the, the, the browser and the camera, everything in your glasses, and you, and you can sort of look to the right and see web pages and kind of interact. How many of you have heard of Google Glass and Google Glasses? So that, that's, again, a product. It's not science fiction. And so imagine if you're going to, uh, to an interview with Google Glasses, and you can kind of look up stuff on Wikipedia while you're being asked questions, uh, you'll be a lot more impressive candidate than many people to do that. Uh, in fact, in phone interviews, you can actually already do that by, you know, by typing away quietly while you do questions on Skype. Um, but imagine if instead of being up in your glasses, it's actually directly into your brain. There's no reason it has to be made in the glass. It's already went from the desktop to the glasses. You can go from the glasses to your brain, have the chip, and you enter the connection in your head and plant it. So that you can actually surf the web while you're talking to people, looking them up. And you don't even have to do all that yourself. You know, the system can actually notice somebody, look them up on the web, and tell you exactly who there is and who, what their vita is, their, their resume and their bio, and you know a whole lot about them before you even shake their hand five seconds later. Um, all that's coming also. Anyway, so technology is already merging with humans. The idea is that it will merge more and more, and it will go advance and uh, evolve even faster, and at some point, you know. It, it will happen exponentially and so fast that it will kind of run away from us. That's called the technological singularity. So right now we are here, right between the technological epoch and the merger of technology with humans to, to a very you know, high degree. It's already starting. And soon enough we might be in this last epoch where it's, uh, the universe just wakes up. It's, uh, uh, technology takes over, starts using raw materials, entire planets can become alive. As, as giant AIs and send probes to other planets, other solar systems, other parts of the universe, and the universe itself will become woke. Uh, that's the that's the that's the thing. That's the uh, the, the idea there, of the technological singularity. Uh, it may seem far fetched. Uh, some people think you know it's already well underway in happening. Uh, people can debate about how fast it'll happen. Uh, Ray Kurzweil says it'll happen in a few decades. You know, not not, lot, not not more than a few decades. Uh, I think it's a little bit optimistic, or it may not happen at all, or we can may try to put an end to it somehow, or, or it may, may start running away from us and we can't even stop it. Uh, we don't know, actually. We, we, we have no idea. But we're in a very interesting era of the evolution of the universe, where biological systems have created technology that now evolves 
a million times faster than evolution, and in fact can affect the evolution itself, using you know, gene splicing of, and editing genomes and so on, for better or worse. Right? Uh, some Chinese scientists just a few months ago announced that we modified humans, and they actually got born and they're alive. It's the first modified humans. And he said that we did that to prevent them from having a gene that, that make them susceptible, susceptible to AIDS. And it sounds like a good thing, but it it's actually could be a very dangerous thing. Because now, you know, when they have children, they have this modification. And it's very hard to tell whether the modification is good or bad or indifferent and what the long-term consequences are. The humans are very bad at predicting long-term consequences. And global warming is one example of that. You know, just burn fossil fuels and drive cars that run on dead dinosaurs as fuel. That, that, that's on the face of it a good idea to begin with. But then, you know, if the polar caps melt, despite what our president says, uh, our planet has a very, very uh, hard and sad future potential. Um, so it's hard to tell where, where things go and what the consequences are. But uh, that's, that's what the technological singularity is, this theory. And you know, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as Kurzweil says, but it could be some milder version of it. But it's definitely a trend. It's undeniable. Think about how technology advanced in just the last 10 or 20 years since you know, most of you are in grade school. Um, and uh, you know, it's very dramatic, uh, the change and the, and the pace of the change. So there's also a lot of warnings about that. You already mentioned a few, the gray blue phenomena, you know, it's a dangerous suit still in Keanu Reeves, which is a remake of the old 1930s movies, where dangerous suit still and nanobots would take over and use stuff around us as raw materials. And, you know, when you start having nanobots use stuff around them as raw materials, humans are just raw material. Uh, and everything, you know, humans built is also raw material in the whole, whole package of one ball of gray blue. So this is kind of a gray blue kind of um, fear or concern that uh, these technologies and futures have. And it's not unfounded. I mean, this, 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 could, this, could, this could be, you know, a real danger. Um, and when you have books that are called nanotechnology for dummies, you know the field is advanced you know, to a point where you know you have popular books that teach you know, children about nanotechnology that it's, uh, you know, it's not only here, it's, it's, it's significant, these kind of technologies. Uh, and of course we already saw the, you know, the Terminator kind of scenarios, we talked about that. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be very good, it can just be machines running, running amok. And it's, uh, it's a valid concern. Uh, you know, it's the, old, it's the old Frankenstein story that we take it to the next technological level. You know, you create technology that uh, you, know, you can't control anymore and has a life of its own and becomes sentient, it requires you know, free will, and then all bets are off as to what would suit its purposes. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if it agrees with you, everything will be fine. Uh, but if you disagree, you and the technology disagree with each other, you know, you're going to have a very bad day. Uh, for a very bad decade or future. So there's a lot of writing about that. Uh, famous article by uh, Bill Joy called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, and he kind of raises this kind of alarm bells about great view and run away technology and negative consequences that we can't control and, uh, and we won't like when it, when it happens. And Bill Joy, by the way, is no slouch. He co-founded Sun Microsystems. He uh, co-invented Java and did a lot of other Pretty interesting. So he's got a lot of street cred uh, uh, comes with him. So when he, he, tell, he, he talks about stuff like that. You know, it's, we should listen. It's not just uh, just alarmist. It's uh, you know, he, uh, he has some interesting points. And of course, there's there's counter arguments against that that we shouldn't be so worried. That it'll all be good, and you know, we, we we won't have terminators, and uh, technology won't do anything bad to us. Uh, the truth is probably somewhere between those two extremes. It's, uh, it won't, be, it won't be all good. It's already not all good. Uh, there's things like Chernobyl and, and uh, you know, uh, global warming and all sorts of other kind of global scale kind of you know, disasters and consequences. And so it's uh, there's definitely things to be worried about. Uh, but it shouldn't just be all uh, paranoia and, and uh, refusal to, to, to move forward and uh, embrace technology in, in good ways because it's helping us a lot. The reason that humans can live to 80 or 90 or 100 of these things is because of technology. It's not from modern technology and modern medicine and science and biology and chemistry and all the things that are saving our lives and um, allowing us, because you know, the average age used to be you know, 30. 
back a few centuries ago. I forgot to be 40, but you were really, really lucky and unusual. Um, never mind you know, people suffered in really terrible ways just a couple of centuries ago, and now you know, we can mitigate a lot of that. But it also has negative consequences as well. Sometimes it's abused, and uh, sometimes it's not used well, it's not abused. Uh, so anyway, that's one of the articles that uh, group uh, pro and against kind of uh, technological uh, arguments in our philosophy. There's a technological singularity summit. Every year they get together and, and talk about all these things and where, where technology is going. And these, again, are very interesting people. These are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, paranoids or, 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 or people who are anti-technology. A lot of these people uh, you, you already know. You know. Some of these people that, that uh, run the technological singularity summits that are happening every year. There's even a technological singularity university. Um, and uh, some of them are, you know, Peter Thiel, who uh, co-founded uh, PayPal and uh, Facebook, actually. Uh, Stephen Wolfram of uh, Mathematica, I actually met him once in the 80s, right after he got his MacArthur Junior's Prize that he used to create a piece of software that symbolic math that later became Mathematica. Interesting guy. Uh, so, uh, so they get together and ponder all the consequences and uh, trends and try to project where things are going and how fast we get there. It's a pretty interesting, uh, grandiose kind of discussions and ideas and uh, philosophical considerations. So, uh, a lot more to read about all that stuff. You know, for extra credit, follow some of the links and tell me what you think, what you found. Uh, any uh, any questions about any of this or thoughts? You know, this is this kind of stuff will affect all of us. Actually, it has already affected all of us. Um, you know, Facebook, the, the social media, has all sorts of interesting unintended consequences. Uh, Facebook, uh, it sounds good. You, know, you have pictures, everybody can see your family, your vacation, what you had for lunch yesterday. It sounds pretty benign, but uh, it's causing a lot of depression in, in many people. Uh, people look at Facebook and see there's a lot of pretensions going on. People pretend they have cool lives when they really don't and try to impress everybody. When, meanwhile, they're watching everybody else who's doing the same thing and they're, they're getting depressed that everybody's cooler than they are and have better vacations and been to nicer places and had you know, cooler friends, and it's contributed to mental, mental illness and depression and uh, schizophrenia and other things. You know, my, my brother is a psychologist, and he uh, treats people, among other the usual stuff like depression and bipolar disorders, he treats people with uh, Facebook addiction and more generally uh, video game addiction. And video games, it's not only video games like Atari, you know, asteroids, or that kind of thing. Video games have advanced to the point where you have you know, Second Life. You know, uh, games like Second Life, which simulates a whole, whole world. Uh, world of Warcraft type games, where you have a simulated world. So it's almost like Neo in the Matrix stuff. You know, Keanu Reeves, you know, is Neo in the Matrix, kind of living in an alternate reality that, you know, and some of these patients come to my brother, a psychologist, and says, you know, I'm, I'm in this virtual world, 16 hours a day, I've lost my job, I, my wife left me, my kids won't talk to me, and, you know, and I can't stop, you know, and they're addicted, it's, it's a real addiction, like drugs or alcohol or gambling addiction. Because in this, you know, and my brother says, you know, so why don't you just stop cold turkey, just stop it, just disable your account and start having a life, because I can't, and, and my brother says, why not, he says, well, I'm, this, I'm a mayor in Second Life of this virtual town, and my, my citizens depend on me coming every day and around their town, and you know, all these avatars running around, and I'm in charge. And I can't just stop. You know, what, what would happen if I stop? You know, it would be a disaster. And, and, and my brother says, mm, okay, and we have a lot of work to do here in this case. And, and a lot of people are in this category. They live on lives, whether it's in Facebook for Second Life, or World of Warcraft, or, or some other virtual world. And, Video games are, again, I say games, they're not games, they're, they're reality simulations. And some people have a much better life in, in this simulation than they do in the real world. Uh, some people actually make a living in these virtual worlds. You know, they make clothes for avatars. So if you don't like the way the avatar is dressed, you can buy designer clothes for your avatar, your avatar will look a lot cooler. Because, and, and you pay in real dollars on eBay for virtual clothes, or even virtual weapons, magic potions and magic swords that you buy in these worlds virtual item, but you're paying real dollars on eBay or on PayPal, and some people make a living creating these virtual items. How, how do you know that? But they make a very good thing, so I make six figures, or even seven figures, just creating virtual items in the virtual world. So, it, so it, it's, it's no longer a game. It's your job. It's your life at that point. 
and uh, and something you can make a lot more money as virtual games than have any any real job in the real. World. So it's blending together the virtual world and the real world, and you know, it's causing a lot of issues. And psychologists haven't even began to wrap their minds about all the consequences of that. And some of it is, is not positive consequences. Companies already are recruiting in these virtual worlds. Uh, even even the CIA is, has virtual world recruiting in World of Warcraft and Second Life and all these other games. Um, you know, they follow, they track the avatar and see who has the real skills to do whatever it is these agencies need to do, and then they contact these, these avatars and help the person behind them to join the organization. And they're already doing that actively. Um, it was interesting to, to read about somebody in a virtual world created a video game like Simon, you know, like a handheld video game for avatars in the virtual world. So you're already in a virtual world, which is basically a game or a simulated reality. And inside, you have a handheld game that you can play while you're in this virtual game. So now your reality is like two times removed from the real world, not just once. You're in a virtual game, and inside, you're playing another smaller virtual game. And that's you know, pretty convoluted. Any, any questions or comments about any of that? It's, uh, it's pretty interesting trends. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. where is actually going to go? We don't know, but we'll see. We're right here, and things are moving very fast. Yeah. The people are going to start making a lot of money by watching other people. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these games become spectator sports. You can actually, you know, we actually have tournaments of these games. Some people make their living you know, beating other people in these virtual worlds and tournaments. And uh, uh, these tournaments actually, or, or these games, are so sophisticated that they completely mimic real life. There's actually crime rates and organized crime inside these games. Interesting. So people getting together with nefarious intent and they rob other avatars of their valuables. Right, whether it's gold coin or, or, or you know, artifacts that they bought on eBay, and they steal it and they beat them up, and sometimes they kill their avatar. Sometimes they rape their avatar. And some of these games have you know sexual you know, overtones and, and very explicit ones. And some people are, are suing because their avatar got raped or killed or beaten or murdered, and they sue in real courts in the real world saying they were really traumatized and won millions of dollars of damage you know, from the company that, that runs these platforms because they were, they were seriously traumatized. And, you know, some, something terrible was done to the avatar, and the, the courts are grappling to even work to even determine the legality of some of these situations. If you go into the virtual world and rob some avatar and deprive them of property, steal their you know, magic potion or their gold coin that they have in the game, but that they tailed real money on eBay or PayPal to acquire, did, did you commit a felony or not? And the courts are completely in agreement about the consequences. Because you rob them of real value. You know, they, they say, spent a thousand dollars acquiring these things which you just stole from them illegally inside the game, inside the virtual world. And they essentially committed grand theft. And they deprive you of real value. You actually paid US dollars for it, not just Linden dollars or Avatar dollars or whatever it's called. Um, so the legal system hasn't even caught up to, to these kind of scenarios. You know, has a crime been committed? You know, even that question is nowadays very fuzzy, vague, and debatable, and arguable, and there's court cases that are very difficult to resolve. Um, yeah, and, and so these virtual worlds mimic human behavior. You can become a developer, and build buildings, and sell it in the virtual world for real dollars, or even virtual dollars, and make money, and do things, and could be robbed, and threatened, and extorted, and even killed, and rob a car can, and and often these consequences are spilled in the real world. And they have very serious real world consequences. It's not just all fun and games. You get very serious very fast. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah. All right, well, stuff to think about. Uh, so, uh, next time we'll start talking about envy completeness. Uh, fascinating theory that involves analyzing the difficulty of problems, the intrinsic difficulty of problems, and moving them together and coming up with fast new distance from the back of the world. Nice. See you